Until recently, water-bearing asteroids appeared to solve the mystery of Earth's first oceans. But an incredible new geological discovery suggests these impacts only tell part of the story. There's an amazing amount of water on the surface of the Earth. The Pacific Ocean has an area of roughly half the surface of the Earth, millions and millions of cubic miles of water. And yet, that's not where all the water on Earth is. There's quite a bit of it under the surface. In recent years, geologists have made a stunning discovery. A layer of hot rock lying deep below the Earth's crust holds vast quantities of water. Seismologists make the discovery by analyzing the rumble of earthquakes. When a big earthquake strikes, low-frequency sound waves travel through the different layers of Earth's interior before hitting the crust on the other side of the planet. Studies of these long-range rumbles show some of the sound waves slow down when they reach a scorching layer of rock sitting 300 miles below the crust. And there's only one thing known to delay the passage of sound through rock. Water. Now, it's not like an ocean of water. It's water molecules bound up in minerals and with other molecules. But if you take all that water and put it all together, we think it actually would add up to more than all the water in all the oceans on the Earth combined. This vast underground reserve of water is a genuine puzzle. Because there's no way comets or asteroids could have penetrated so deeply below the Earth's crust. That's actually inside the Earth. It doesn't seem that there's an easy way to get it from the surface down hundreds of miles into the mantle. So it seems far more likely that that water that exists, that was discovered, came with the Earth when it formed. Vast quantities of water must have been in the mix when the Earth was created. But this simple fact means everything we think we know about the birth of our planet is wrong. The heat of the sun evaporates water from the surface of the Earth's hottest places. Mile after mile of parched sand dunes, there's no water here. Five billion years ago, the great cosmic desert that stretches from the young sun to the snow line is just as dry. How could the wet interior of our planet form out of this rocky, arid dust? We think that the materials that were forming in the solar system right where the Earth is today would have been much more dry than the Earth actually is. So we think that the Earth had to get an extra contribution of water-rich material. Where did all this extra cosmic water come from? Something must have transported it in bulk from the wet side of the snow line. A clue comes from observing distant exoplanets broiled alive by their parent stars. And what we see a lot of are Jupiter-sized planets sitting really close to their star, sometimes extremely close, sometimes much closer than Mercury is to the sun. At first, these star-grazing giants were a mystery. How did they grow so big, so far away from the icy riches of the snow line? The only solution, these planets must have formed farther out from their stars, and then later moved in. We know that those kind of planets can't form there. They're simply too big. They must have formed farther out and moved inward, migrated towards their star. And that is interesting because that makes you wonder, was our solar system always the configuration it is today? Or have our planets moved back and forth? Exoplanet observations prompt astronomers to devise a radical new theory 
about the formation of our own solar system. Known as the Grand Tack, this idea has Jupiter radically changing its course. There was a time when the disk of dust and gas was very thick around the young sun. And that actually put a drag on planets as they orbited around. In the Grand Tack model, Jupiter forms on the outer wet side of the snow line. But slowed down by the matter around it, the gas giant's orbit spirals in closer to the sun. There's amazing evidence that Jupiter may have moved in as far as the orbit of Mars. And when Jupiter moves in, it brings with it a whole lot of water from beyond the snow line. And this is a chance to push material from much further out in the solar system and throw it into the region where the Earth is forming, a chance to add a bunch of water-rich material to an otherwise dry Earth. It's kind of like a huge snowplow just blasting this material and pushing it inwards so that while the Earth was forming, Jupiter could have been scattering a bunch of icy bodies from the outer part of the solar system into where the Earth was forming while the Earth was still being put together. Jupiter's inward spiral stops after 100,000 years when Saturn forms. As the gravity from these two massive planets interact, they change tack hitting away from the sun. The water Jupiter leaves behind clumps together with dust to form Earth and its neighboring rocky planets. But how did this water, trapped inside Earth, turn into the first oceans? Volcanoes could have played a crucial role. Think about the very young Earth as a blister of volcanic activity. You see these giant clouds of ash and dust falling down, but in there, there also would have been water vapor. Water vapor that could have cooled and condensed in the atmosphere, built up clouds over hundreds or maybe even thousands of years, until there was a moment when there was enough water in the atmosphere to begin to rain. There really was a first rain billions of years ago. As volcanic water rains down on the surface of the Earth, the first rivers and oceans develop, long before the heavy bombardment that brings comets and asteroids to Earth. Based on evidence from the rocks, it appears that that liquid water is indigenous, native to our planet. Comets and asteroids brought some water to Earth. But if the Grand Tack theory is right, then Jupiter delivered most of the water we see filling our oceans today.